Okay, go ahead, please. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Sabrina Monarch of Monarch Astrology and I am doing the second of a series on the nodal axis uh, when it is squared. So this means that a planet is at a 90 degree angle to the nodal axis and this is one of my favorite signatures to track in natal charts. It's something that I've really put a lot of focus into as someone who has planet squaring my nodes and it's been super helpful to understand that and the purpose of these talks is to give more information about um, a specific nuance of this where if you research the south node or the north node it basically implies that the person has developed their south node and they're moving into their north node but when someone has planet square the nodes they've actually developed both of their nodes so what would that look like through the different nodes so I'm going to share my screen now to show you my slides and we'll get started. Okay, so uh, the first few slides will be a review from last time and then we'll get into Taurus and Scorpio and it's a really good day for this because we just had the full moon in the sign of Scorpio, Sun and Taurus. So what does the conditions of planet squaring the lunar nodes imply? Um, that the planet forming the square is up for major integration in this lifetime. So there's a lot that we could say about the planet itself, but for this talk, we're focusing on the nodal axis. There's an impasse both regarding the squaring planet and the axis of the nodes themselves. So some basics on the lunar nodes. In evolutionary astrology, Pluto is the bottom line desire nature of the chart. It's the psychology of the soul, and it represents the soul's deepest unconscious rhythms and fixations, what we're still gripping onto, why we keep incarnating. And so this is going to hold both places of power, things that we've developed, and powerlessness, what's still unresolved and still our deepest cutting edge. The south node of the moon is the vehicle through personality. Uh, by which the soul has tended to incarnate. If Pluto is the why of the chart, then the south node is the historic how. And then the north node of the moon is the direction of the soul in this lifetime, what the soul is developing. And with the south node, I just want to point out some misnomers. People think that the south node's bad or that it's something to leave behind. And Thus, they may feel like, okay, forget what my south node is in, forget that part of myself, let me just jump into my north node and evolve. But the south node um, is more like a restoration or a relive of certain things that we've developed in prior lives. So, and so while there may be some limitations to the south node and that we're here to evolve into the north node, there's still some useful things that we've picked up. Um, and so there's a metaphor that Mark Jones has shared before about being on a plane to your destination. You have a suitcase packed and it probably has some useful stuff in it. So um, we can say that the south node is potentially more neutral, right? When you have a planet or any number of planets squaring the nodes, this means that both nodes have been developed in prior lives. And the individual has vacillated between extreme expressions of both nodes without integration yet. And the planet squaring the nodes is related to a crisis or impasse regarding this nodal situation. And for any chart that you're looking at, just because it's worth noting, um, the planet squaring the nodes is going to be resolved through the node that it last made a conjunction with. And you can start by when you're looking at a natal chart, start on that planet that's squaring the nodes and move in a clockwise direction around the chart and the first node that you hit is the resolution node. But because the nodes are uh, complementary archetypes or two sides of the same coin, they're opposite signs, it's actually the health of both nodes and the integration of the signs that's going to really help um, the squared planet. Okay, and so what I'm about to get into is first I'm going to share some things on the south node in Taurus and the second house um, without it being a squared situation. And then I'll do the opposite for south node in Scorpio. And then I'll show what it looks like to come into this lifetime with both of those polarities developed and working between the extremes of both. So first to get to know the south node in Taurus or the second house a little bit more. 
um, which is North Node in Scorpio and North Node in the eighth house. These natives are used to working hard in prior lives and they may have little issue in this life working or working multiple jobs at once. And they've achieved their goals methodically and with thoroughness, perhaps slowly. They're very intimate with their work. Pleasure and indulgence is familiar to them and they can like nice things and luxuries and good food. Um, and they're very sensual. So I, I picture like someone on a cooking show or something and just like watching how someone who's really into cooking touches and relates to food. Like they're very much in it. And so whatever the, um, the work is, when we think about Taurus relating to self-esteem as well, there's a quality of self-value or um, esteem that we get from doing a good job or feeling like we're actualizing our um, gifts through these like tangible things that we're doing. And these individuals may have cultivated their wealth in prior lives at whatever gradient. So wealth can mean very many different things, right? Um, and they can be possessive of their projects. Um, they resist help or collaboration from others because it means giving up ownership um, and having to take in external um, input. And then uh, they more feel like they're capable of doing the whole thing on their own alone. And they don't wanna be rushed, right? And so uh, this is Iggy Azalea, and it's um, a lyric from one of her songs called Work, and it's Pledge Allegiance to the Struggle. And you'll see why I included that in a moment. Um, but this theme about like work and wanting to do things by themselves and being self-reliant um, also applies to self-identity and sexuality and where they're investing their erotic energy. Um, something that I meant to mention at the beginning is that both Scorpio and Taurus are um, erotic, focused, resilient, tenacious signs, like they're fixed. And I feel like they both have a really strong connection to eroticism, but in different ways. And Taurus is the side where we're in touch with our own energy and our own essence. And if this is really highly developed, as it often is for the South Node and Taurus person, they have a pattern often of being reticent to um, interact with people or situations that are gonna create a lot of change or transformation for them. They like having things be stable. And that comes um, at the cost sometimes of getting in a rut, but they certainly have stability down, which is a skill set that maybe, for example, the South Node and Scorpio person doesn't as much. And because of this, stubbornness to do things their own way. Uh, they can often do things in life the hard way because they're just used to plodding along. Um, they have past life experiences of just working um, all day and they, they can really take an environment or a situation and work with it and cultivate it and there's like a, um, a satisfaction that they feel from doing that. There's also this, um, you know, there can be other factors in the chart. So always remember that with these generalizations that I'm sharing. But there can be a simple or kind of pastoral quality to this placement, as though these individuals have had past lives where um, their life was earth-based and slow and low to the ground, um, homesteading or farming lives, and having really more direct concerns with matters of survival, um, if the crop was gonna yield, um, if they're gonna have enough, and so it's very tangible, very simple, very literal, and not a lot of excess drama. Sure, it is dramatic to wonder where your next meal is going to come from, but we're talking about like a tangible circumstance and not like a situation of intrigue or great drama. And they're learning in this lifetime how to merge energy and resources with others. Um, they've already developed so much of their own self-reliance. And left to their own devices, they get stuck in ruts and they can accumulate a very heavy um, kind of kapha or tamas kind of energy. Um, and you can just think of this in the simple way of like, if you um, had to invent all your meals, like everything you were gonna eat and you didn't get external feedback about 
um, what other people around you were eating or you didn't ever read a recipe book or have someone else cook for you. Like you would probably just eat the same thing over and over again. And it's through interactions with other people that we get ideas and we change, right? And so the second house or South Node and Taurus person, they may have variety in their environment, but their focus is more narrow and on themselves and on their own essence, their own energy. And these individuals have accumulated a lot of internal value in this life and in prior lives. Um, so other individuals may recognize what they have to offer, right? Um, and they can also see outside of that tunnel that the South Node and Taurus person is in. So that person's like in the rut somewhere and someone else viewing them from the outside sees the whole landscape and they're like, what about trying that other thing? Um, and so other people will often author, offer the South Node in Taurus or South Node in the second house person some suggestions on how they could accomplish their goals uh, more uh, efficiently or faster. And this can really threaten the South Node and Taurus person. And we know this about Taurus just as an energy that they don't like to be rushed, but this is a whole set of like personality and ego structures. So it's someone that, you know, tends to do things slow and maybe the hard way and people are like, you know, do you want to try something else? So um, what is happening here when other people are giving them these suggestions is that it's kind of like their North Node uh, in Scorpio or the eighth house, those lessons knocking on their door, like, hey, collaborate, um, and learning how to answer that call. And so by default, the South Node in Taurus, and I'm just going to say Taurus from now on, but know that I mean Taurus or the second house. So the South Node in Taurus person is going to be likely to resist the other person's suggestion or their energy in the situation which exhibits as stubbornness, like this person's just stubborn. And if we unpack that a little bit more, like what's this stubbornness motivated by, these are some possibilities. One is that this person just has a history, like a long, uh, you know, kind of like accordion fan of past life, uh, or Stanislav Grof calls these systems of condensed experience. So if you think about like, every time you've ever felt held and safe and you have this fan of memories that goes back of that kind of key. The South Node is a little bit like that. It's your past life memory. It's what kind of tone um, or circumstances or personality traits you've tended to inhabit. So they just have a long history of doing things by themselves and sourcing their security in doing it alone. And this could have related to past lives where the situation that they were in was basically just requiring that they have to scrape by on account of their own strength and tenacity or otherwise you die. Like it's not uh, negotiable. And often the situation of our South Node has that tenor to it of like, it's where we're sourcing our security, but the situation has changed. There's more room or more possibilities in our reality, perhaps. And so maybe it's like the person's still holding on to that sense that I have to do this myself or I'll die um, when things may actually be different in this life. Working with another person's suggestions means that they have to step outside of their own value system, which they're reticent to do. Um, it's not the strategy that they've gotten by with in the past. And integrating another person's feedback means tuning into something outside of themselves which threatens their sense of self-reliance. Um, they may not feel strong, like it can bring out feelings of weakness, and they've really been managing by doing things on their own. So when someone else wants to help or the environment is kind of knocking on their door in a certain way, they have to learn how to tune in to that invitation or that offer and feel into if it feels enhancing. Um, and also, where's that other person coming from? Feeling into the motivations or the psychological motivations of the other person and assessing and discerning if they trust it, if they like it, if it feels good, and if they're willing to change because of having external feedback. When these natives are not open to feedback or perspectives from others, they limit their reality to their own point of view and they'll become stagnant and stuck. 
their reticence to trust or to see value in others creates even more stuckness because it prevents them from accepting change or the influence that other people might bring. And these individuals can be so in touch with themselves, sometimes though with a lack of perspective because they're just so in it and they're not super aware of their blind spots per se, that merging or sharing with other people feels like a death. And in a sense it is. Um, if you've been hermetic and in your own energy and you merge and bond with someone else, you're going to lose that sense of uh, your bubble and your autonomy and feel yourself change. So if you're attached to having like built this armor, built this strength around yourself, then uh, when we think about Scorpio and sex, death and rebirth, right, that's a big shift from the Taurus reality. And it can often be the case that these individuals, because they have been so hermetic or so in their own energy, that they can often be attractive to other people, that they have this um, relationship to their body or their physicality or their inner talents and resources that you know, other people can really sense the value in them and they're attracted to them. Um, and also this person's innate connection to sensuality and their body can make them really receptive lovers as well. So to switch it now to go to the south node in Scorpio, I actually just want to pause here and see if there's any questions real quick. Yes, Sabrina. Um, what about when these people with the North Node in Scorpio do not trust others, perhaps because um, they're tuning into being violated in the past or you know, for example, thievery or, you know, um, their possessions being stolen or something like that. Any comments? Yeah, I think that um, they've developed a, a pattern or an ego structure where instead of learning how to read other people deeply and how to like get psychologically more aware of other people's motivations, it's been easier to just be like, well, forget other people. I'm going to hunker down and focus on my, what I own and like be here with my resources. So it's, it's that they haven't even necessarily stepped too much into the process of learning how to trust. They've relied on themselves instead. Got it. That's great advice. Thank you. So this, we'll come back to that theme because when we look at the, merging of these two nodes um, when they have been squared, that theme will come back up. So for Scorpio South Node or Eighth House South Node and the North Node in Taurus, so the opposite situation, um, unlike the South Node in Taurus counterpart, these individuals don't have as much experience with self-made wealth. So South Node and Taurus people have bonded primarily to themselves and their environment and they've made something of their immediate environment. And South Moon and Scorpio people have had a different survival pattern, which is that they've merged and bonded with powerful others and have expressed their value through relationship. And unlike the simple pastoral qualities of the South Moon and Taurus's uh, environments that they've tended to incarnate into, the South Moon and Scorpio person's environment has more of an inferno quality. And I'm being dramatic, it may or may not actually be as dramatic for everyone who has that. But intense is the Scorpio keyword. And while the South Moon and Taurus person was mapping like the land and how much it's rained and how to plant with the moon and just these like tangible things, the South Moon and Scorpio person has been mapping the complex psychological dynamics and dramas of other people. And there's situations of power struggle and intrigue and Sometimes abuse um, is also part of it. And I think, you know, with abuse too, it's like people uh, learn how to read people very well if they've been abused as a child because it's part of their survival. And these people with this South Node signature naturally get involved, like involved is such a key word here. They get involved in drama, in other people's business, and in the motivations and needs of others. And 
they've done this to survive um, and to get their needs met and they've developed a talent you know for being attuned to other people in that way um, but this can also be very triggering for other people if they didn't ask for this kind of psychological penetration so it's kind of like um, if you picture like a room full of people and everyone's like subconscious is like represented in front of them with like a rock or something and no one's upturning these rocks and trying to look underneath them but you have a south node and scorpio person who's just like pulling up the rock looking in it and being like hey did you have you thought about this and the person's like why are you telling me this thing like that's you know too intense too triggering like you see me too deeply so they may not know that they're doing that it's like being unconsciously very provocative um, because it's such a natural tendency to look underneath things and they may not even realize that they're doing that. At that point, it's not even like they're trying to, it's just like they have laser vision because they've developed this capacity to see into the secret like corners of things in prior lives. They may have had past lives where power struggles were very prominent um, and in the same way that, uh, well, I was speaking of this, like South Moon and Taurus people are learning how to study the land and know that it's going to yield a crop. Um, South Moon and Scorpio people have incarnated into environments where being in tune with other people's psychology and secret motivations was the way to survive. Um, so this can involve the presence of abusive or unscrupulous or power hungry people who do have some power over the native, especially when the person is a child. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, not everyone with South Node in Scorpio has had an abusive childhood. Some have, and for them often learning and making the choice in adulthood to not repeat those patterns is a deep uh, process of healing and transformation. So if they have been put in these compromised positions where they've been around unscrupulous people or people that they couldn't trust, they have learned how to read other people, how to have hunches and how to feel into others when, how to feel into if others are telling the truth or if they're lying. Um, and even so that there can still be that mysterious, like what do people really want? Are they lying to me? Like there's that distrust versus trust theme on this side as well. And at a lower level, this individual can be unscrupulous themselves with their power needs, and they know how to manipulate other people. They may have had to manipulate other people in prior lives to survive or earlier in this life. Um, but in this lifetime with that Taurus North Node or second house North Node, they're really learning about personal space and peace and building things of value that they have ownership of. So with Scorpio, there can be more of a situation of envy and jealousy um, and vengeance and revenge, like these really sticky kind of psychological attachments um, and feeling as though we need another person or we need their resources to survive versus the Taurus, like building it ourselves and having ownership over it and not worrying about, are, are they going to try to take it from me or who should I try to... Uh, steal from or like that whole kind of survival lower like root chakra kind of crisis and conflict energy when there's a more difficult experience with these archetypes and due to many experiences of crisis or cataclysm or bottoming out or destruction these individuals often have a strong relationship with adrenaline and thrill um, and they can be addicted or drawn to it and that can be unconscious too. If it's a pattern that they've had so often, it just feels like home, right? Um, they're very aware of the power of regeneration. They're not afraid of building bridges or letting situations end up in flames or having things blow out. Um, they've survived these kind of things before. And it's just at some point in this life, they may be very tired of not having stability or all this drama um, and, not having built something that feels stable or sturdy or lasting. It's important for them to develop a stronger relationship of self. In this case, like what do they like and value? And not what others like or value or what they think they need to do or like in order to survive. 
um, but a truly kind of self-oriented perception on what's valuable to them. And also move toward environments of stability where they can leave this kind of espionage, like war, inferno, kind of South Node and Scorpio space and steadily build toward a goal that brings them self-esteem. And when their external environment ceases to be super chaotic, if they were born into a chaotic environment, um, their individual landscape may hold some of that adrenaline patterning. And unconsciously, this can be exercised as a way to create unnecessary drama or to sabotage long-term goals or you know, create ripples when things are calm just because that feels more comfortable and more normal. Um, so what can help them heal that in a sense is focus more on the quality of ownership, um, like owning their relationship with their body or the projects or their relationship with wealth and finances instead of being in a destructive, like burn it all down kind of mindset. Um, this image came to me like I was working on this and I heard like the poor unfortunate souls like Ursula song in my head. So I figured it had this archetypal resonance because you have um, this kind of predatory nature of this character and how she really like preys upon other people's weaknesses and flaws in order to control and manipulate them. And with the Scorpio, like that's gonna be the lower side of Scorpio. So that can be a quality within the person or a quality within their environment. And even just something that they, like they can spot it, they can see it in a room, like who's trying to get something, like they have that awareness. And if their ownership needs aren't sufficiently addressed. And so this is owning one's inner talents or capacities or one's power. Um, like even when it comes to like as a simple example, if we believe that someone is making us upset and we really believe that versus knowing that a person is having an action and we are choosing an emotional response. And if we're not even at that place mentally where we can conceive that we have some agency in how we respond, then we've completely given our power away. And when we do that, then we're, more likely to want to manipulate others so that we feel better. Um, so having ownership of like, this is my body, these are my emotions, I can feel however I want, is going to change um, how manipulative or not manipulative a person is. And we know too, like Taurus kind of has a superpower of like the force field. Like, I don't care what you think of me, like I'm in my own world, like you don't bother me. <laughs> and that's something that the South Node and Scorpio people often need. Um, and they're also learning how to develop self-sufficiency and self-esteem as a baseline to approach uh, the bonds and energy exchanges that they create with others so that they're creating more mutually enhancing situations and win-win situations instead of win-lose or lose-lose situations which are more manipulative or predatory or abusive, right? Um, if this individual redirects their powerful focus toward building something of tangible value uh, rather than their destructive or their uncovering or their exposing kind of impulses. Um, and they allow themselves this experience of ownership and taking pride in the fruits of what they're building, they will learn necessary lessons around tranquility and stability. They're really learning how to harness um, and work with their passion in a practical way. And when triggered, people with South Node in Scorpio or the eighth house, they can often tend toward thoughts of doing something extreme, leaving the situation, cutting ties, um, whatever like extreme thing they think of. And they can also be learning how to cultivate this aspect of their inner landscape. Um, different ways that they can respond or how they can be constructive instead of destructive. And their instinctual and depth-oriented quality that they naturally have can bring a lot of richness um, into what they cultivate. Because we already covered how the person with the Taurus background may be stable, but they're stuck in a rut. And so we're looking more with South Moon and Scorpio as someone who's very 
uh, intense, right? And learning how to cultivate something stable. So they bring that juiciness or that intenseness or that drama into something uh, that they can cultivate at a more practical level. Now that um, I hope that those two different realities appear distinct, that you have someone who's been more self-reliant in the past and they're learning how to engage with others versus someone who's been uh, just kind of so merged and in these intense power struggles that learning how to have autonomy or self-reliance and self-esteem is going to help them interact with others in a more balanced way. Um, but if we look at someone vacillating between these nodal realities, um, this means that they've developed the south node and the north node before this incarnation. And then they come here more as, I've been using the word hybrid. So they're not just south node and Taurus, but they've got some Scorpio and Taurus when they come into this life. And why do these uh, nodes vacillate between each other? And we can look at, with any of the polarities, any of the oppositions, uh, there's a word, I think it's pronounced enantiodroma, which is like when you go to an extreme, the opposite side of that polarity uh, vies for attention or like has to constellate. So if you're really extreme in Taurus, Scorpio appears, or if you're really extreme in Scorpio, Taurus appears, right? So I'll demonstrate what that looks like. Um, so these are some qualities of the Taurus Scorpio, our second to eighth house quote hybrid. Uh, this person can process deep emotional experiences through the body. The body psyche connection is very strong and a place of direct confrontation and evolution. So it's a strong, deep relationship with the body instead of it um, like a person being more cerebral or a person being more like in their body. It's like both are happening at the same time. Um, highly sexual, both of the Taurus and Scorpio signs um, are pretty sensual and sexual archetypes. Money, sex, power, prominent themes. Uh, root chakra, sacral chakra. Resiliency is a major life theme. So you have the intensity of Scorpio and the tenacity of Taurus. And so there's often a sense of this person ha having overcome some very dramatic situations. Uh, personal power and engaging with powerful others. So what does it mean to really embody one's power and have allurements and attractions to other powerful people? And how does one maintain their autonomy while also merging with another person? That's very instinctual. Um, I put routine catharsis because it's like the rhythms of this person's life is catharsis. Like there's so much um, intensity and gra like there's a heaviness to the fixed signs. And so the, what a person is receiving and taking in their consciousness, they're metabolizing it and processing it. And there's some uh, desire to get it out. And then um, this can relate to careers where the person is marketing themselves. So they're aware of their value and they are um, marketing that. So I put some examples of like a coach, an entrepreneur, a sex worker. Um, I feel like it's always worth mentioning in these talks or when I talk about it, that that's a valid profession. Um, I feel like there's a lot of stigma around it, but there you go with Scorpio being related to the taboo. Um, but this concept of what you do for work being highly connected to you, um, I think is different. Like it's not like that in every profession. Some things are more team oriented or you work for a firm or a company. And though you are bringing your personal skills to the table, it's not um, always such a clear feeling of like, this is me, that is my job. This is a scene from um, James and the Giant Peach. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but um, James is like a kid and his aunts that he grew up with are just these like awful people. And so here are some Taurus Scorpio, our second eighth house nodal hybrid strengths, challenges, and possibilities. One is that you can have an early life environment of toxicity where the individual responds uh, by not becoming like their environment. 
but more so that they claw their way out. They maybe work multiple jobs and save up um, and find a way to get out. These natives can feel very separate and distinct from their potentially violent, chaotic, or disturbed family members, and they really know that it's up to them uh, to find a better life for themselves. So not everyone with this dynamic in their chart has this situation, um, but you can see both Taurus and Scorpio operating in this, where you have the enmeshment and the intensity and the inferno kind of quality of Scorpio, but you have someone who's their own distinct being, like they know what their values are and they're repelled by the situation around them versus just being part of it and not questioning it. There's more of a sense of like, I have to get out. And the family members may or may not be abusive. Obviously not everyone with this signature has an abusive past. Um, the early environment can be dramatic though, full of yelling or complexity or projection or family members with clear psychological issues that they're not taking ownership or accountability for it. And everyone has psychological issues and blind spots. And so not everyone's taking accountability for their deep psyche. Certainly if we're studying evolutionary astrology, we're on that path. But um, the young person with squared Taurus, Scorpio, or second or eighth house nodes, um, and as they grow up too, I mean, there's a sense that they can see through the dynamics of what's happening. They can feel like their stuckness in it and their capacity to get out and have like a bigger or grander lives for themselves. The early life um, may not be so obviously chaotic in its circumstance. If it's more subtle, it's really this depth of the individual's perception that causes the drama. It's like being very aware of the undertones of one's environment and other people's psychological blind spots. So, I mean, thinking about just what if you're a sensitive person and you feel and see very deeply, there may be nothing exactly happening that's like an obvious trauma but if you are super sensitive then you're feeling into things that aren't um, on the surface they're below the surface and you're taking that in and working with that content and these individuals um oh one thing i wanted to say too is that they uh because they see through things they can have this uncanny sense of like, why is everyone lying? <laughs> like they just see through what's happening and in a way that's disturbing to them. And it may take them some time as they get older and more self-aware to realize that they happen to be more psychologically penetrating than other people. Um, or, and that their psychological gifts may be something that they can offer in exchange to other people. These individuals often have a remarkable amount of resiliency. Their life can be full of stories of really intense situations that could have destroyed someone, but they survive. And you often know, you wouldn't know this uh, unless they told you, like they just come off as sturdy. Um, there's that, like really resiliency is a huge word for this axis. And they've often found skill sets and have metabolized some heavy and dense energies that they've encountered. I think like a lot of um, when you meet someone who's like has a really powerful presence and they feel really composed and they're gifted um, and you find out what their life was like growing up or, you know, what they've been through in their life. Like sometimes they have some wild, intense stories, right? So it's that quality of like, They've been through some stuff and they've taken ownership of everything they've learned in the process. These individuals don't arrive <laughs> at a place of tranquility or peace. Um, I mean, really, who does? But they, they just don't. They have um, such a like intense, jungly, kind of erotic experience of reality that it's really more like they're learning how to play with that energy and how to work with it. So interacting with adrenaline and eros and change and cultivation of value in their life, these are going to be constants. They process emotions and events through their bodies and through catharsis. So they may really enjoy expressing and releasing emotion through physical means, 
like dance or intuitive movement or even just like shaking or stomping um anything that feels really um like has that intensity or heat of aliveness in it they can struggle with regulating their needs for self-reliance versus merging and when they go to extremes it can look something like this let's say that their rut is super deep and they've been doing their own thing and not accepting feedback for a really long time. So they're way stuck. Uh, at that point, they can be psychologically vulnerable more so than if they had titrated some feedback in along the way, like if they've gone to this extreme. Uh, the transformation that awaits them can be very drastic when they finally accept the help or the change. Um, they may be at a place of desperation, desperation at that point, such that they overlook psychological red flags in the situation and get involved in something that later turns out to be toxic. You know, like they were, they were so needy in a sense that they were compromised in their uh, discernment. And also the solution to their rut might be such a drastic change that it's kind of adrenaline inducing and intense. Um, I got the image when I was thinking these things out of someone who's been stuck in their ways for decades and they do like a big plant medicine ceremony for the first time and just like that kind of like uh, soul vomiting, like drastic awakening or psychic surgery, like super intense and it's unlocking and kind of working with like heavy, dense, like rut energy of a long period of time. That dynamic just from an energetic standpoint is stressful and destabilizing and it happens from being super stubborn and like no i'm not gonna like you know i'm just here when then they finally open up to a solution and it's super huge um then on the other hand let's say that their over involvement in intense and meshed connections um, has been really intense and it's time for them to step back and be more of a hermit in a way to heal, or this hermeticism is a reaction to the over-involvement. In this hermetic space, they can develop a really strong relationship with themselves. There may be healing in that. Um, and because their over-involvement was itself so traumatic and what they're healing from, uh, they will resist connections with others at that point. Um, and when the time comes for them to merge and connect again, the experience can be much more potent and intense because of all of that time they spent alone and recalibrating their energy and self-attunement. So I think uh, this can be relatable to anyone who, uh, when they're in relationship, it's really deep and it's super profound. And then uh, having periods of being not in relationship, you know, speaking of like main, primary, significant other, and just what it's like to get to know your own energy, and then to feel that energy shift and transmute and die in a sense um, when we merge with someone else. And accepting this process can mean the individual realizes that they have two distinct lives. One is building and getting to know themselves, and the other is experiencing a release or a death of that which they know. What would it be like to do that to kind of merge the two processes happening so that they don't just do one for a couple of years and then the other and kind of go on this like adrenaline roller coaster. But what's it actually like to be sensitive and open enough every day that you feel the small ego deaths of like the smallest interaction you have with someone else that blasts open your heart and you have to like process that later. Like just being a uh, open to the eros or the eroticism of life and the way that that naturally is going to change our self-concept. So the more intense uh, this person's over-involvement, the more they need withdrawal, the more solitude needs kick in. The more intensely developed one's inner resource and inner wealth, the more magnetically drawn others are to merge with them and the more potent the alchemy. Um, so this is just one of the Taurus Scorpio mysteries. I think these signs are very esoteric and have like some deep uh, power and potency attached to them. So sometimes like we really want love and we like want to connect and we're just like kind of leaking out our energy externally and trying to find like somewhere to be connected and nothing's happening for us because we're not really being magnetic in that place. 
But then we tune in, we get into a space where we're happy, where we feel good about ourselves, where we feel uh, blissful and alive, and suddenly people want to connect. <laughs> and so there's that sense of like, um, what really happens when we tune in and take ownership of our essence, uh, the environment starts to kind of bloom in a way of people wanting to connect with us. These individuals are learning how to be self-possessed and wise in their timing with investment and exchange and to learn how to cultivate ownership within themselves of the things that they pick up and learn from their exchanges. Um, I really like to think of the coach in this scenario of like someone who is consistently guiding other people through transformation, but is also transforming all the time and they have a coach that they work with. And so they're intimately aware of their own blocks and they're always like, uh, figuring out how to let go of those blockages and how to take in, you know, new and empowering insights and connections. Um, but they're in the process of tilling that soil. They're not just like letting it sit for a really long time without churning it up. These individuals can be powerful catalyzing figures in others' lives because they've developed so much value in themselves and they also are sharing it. So they're part of this um, web of life. And the, in, these individuals are learning how to attune deeply to the nature of wealth and the exchange of wealth and power. <clears throat> and money and wealth can be such a basic mundane thing, but it can also be like a deep occult, like esoteric thing. Like there's an energy to money. So I think there's that like a uh, tangible budgeting, like working side of Taurus. And there's the, um, receptivity like magic uh esoteric side of taurus and there's the the deep consideration of what we're investing in scorpio how we're investing in ourselves how we're investing in um the web of life like if we're afraid to spend money if we spend money joyfully like there's all these subtle things around wealth right um and the same with power and power exchanges like these things can get very granular and we can get very intelligent about them sexuality um i was just checking the time i feel like i have like a lot to say <laughs> i'm gonna try to get um, through it it's okay sabrina take your time you can uh, go over if you like that's absolutely fine oh thanks linda so sexuality uh this axis is incredibly sexual individuals with this axis can often be very sexual and self-pleasure and sex can be a part of their daily life. Um, within sexuality, this balance of self-possession and willingness to engage are relevant factors. Um, I think like sexuality is such a, a direct kind of metaphor or a direct experience that the Taurus Scorpio axis is playing out in situations that are not necessarily sexual, but have an erotic charge to them. So for example, like our self-concept is our own self-concept. And then we merge with another person. We spend a lot of time, even in a platonic way with someone, and we start to take upon some of their personality traits and we're no longer the same person. So if someone has a consistent like self-pleasure practice and they're having a sexual relationship with themselves, there's both a way that that can be that running of erotic energy through them that makes them more attractive and magnetic to attracting certain kinds of partners, right? There's a sense like if we're feeling sexually starved, then we can experience different power struggles in relationship if we don't feel like we have enough and there's that kind of lack or scarcity thing happening with Taurus. Um, also though, like when we have deep relationships with someone else that can change our self-concept. Um, and there can be challenges around letting go, like getting really attached to someone and then having a hard time being with ourselves after because we lost ourselves in that relationship and now the relationship's over and who are we, you know? And so then there's the re rebirth of self that can happen after the end of a kind of relationship. So there's a deep kind of, I think, current happening with that like erotic relationship with self 
and how that's being influenced by the way that one is interacting with others. Sexuality can be a really deep vessel of transformation and processing for these people. Um, sometimes these individuals do have sexual trauma because of abuse or the sense of neglect or abandonment or starvation. Um, and I mean sexual or emotional starvation. And working with those traumas and blocks can be a place of deep reticence and deep power alike. Um, and I think too, thinking of like how incredibly emotional and deeply seated sexuality is. So even uh, some people have very obvious sexual trauma and then some people have subtle sexual traumas. Like it's a very deep psychological place, right? So looking at how there's this um, transformative arc and the development of self-esteem through this arena of one's life. And sexual healing can be an ongoing journey and discovery. Taurus and Scorpio are fixed signs. And so there's some heavy kind of potent energy that's being moved. And uh, there's ruts with Taurus and there's expanding past those limitations with Scorpio. So with their own healing, sexual and otherwise, these individuals are learning how to play with the edge, where they end and where uh, like the rest of the world or the other begins. Um, and how to play with that edge as to not be incredibly stagnant and just comfortable, but bored and uh, stuck. But also not pushing too hard to the place where there's too much stress or um, too much adrenaline and things start to spin out and get too chaotic. These individuals can develop a powerful inner relationship to themselves and their capacity to build and their capacity to change. Um, they're learning that their deep relationship with themselves is an ecosystem that also involves the relationships with others and their environment. Their internal and relationship landscapes can be very dynamic and rich, and it's important for them to develop self-trust, meaningful relatedness, and personal and shared power. So self-trust gives us the capacity to bond because when we trust ourselves, we trust our instincts, we trust what we're attracted to, um, we trust that we have ourselves at the end of the day. So even if something doesn't work out, we feel like, you know, we've got this. Um, so self-trust is a huge piece in being able to trust others. Um, and it can go the opposite way sometimes too, that sometimes maybe we find ourselves in relationship with someone who teaches us about parts of ourselves that we weren't taking ownership of. And that can happen, as I mentioned, in a more abusive dynamic and, you know, reclaiming your power. And it can also be like in a loving dynamic of having the healing that comes from sharing energy with other people and having reflected back at you parts of yourself that you had not owned before. Um, so it's, it's a back and forth. Like I was sensing the like infinity symbol at this point when I was writing this of like these uh, deep relationship with self and deep capacity to merge are intertwined basically. And I had a few images come to me at this point of different like locations as a metaphor for what I've been talking about. And for Taurus and the second house south node, uh, I was picturing a homestead and a farm and no external help, you have to manage it yourself. And you're learning with that one how to bring other people into the farm and like share energy and um, have people help you do the work and learn how to trust people with the jobs and stuff like that. For Scorpio or the eighth house south node, it's more like a jungle. There's no protection and little understanding how to, of how to set boundaries with other creatures. It's just kind of like everyone for themselves. Um, and you're learning how to have boundary, how to have self-possession and how to relate in a way that comes from a place of self-possession. But then we put them together as a nodal integration towards Scorpio and you get either that homestead or farm with trusted family and friends helping and there's a community um, or a deep and juicy relationship with the jungle and a solid home there and a capacity to understand one's boundaries um, and how to relate to other creatures in the jungle. Um, 
So that is all I have on this. And I just want to, oh no, I had this to close out. So these um, squared nodes, when you have this combination of Taurus and Scorpio influences or second and eighth house, these karmas can likely be dominated by some of these themes in summary. Lessons around personal and shared power, self-possession and expanding past one's limitations through merging resources. Lessons around trust, manifesting abundance and power by learning how to cultivate and exchange value. Challenges and learning around mutually beneficial exchange as opposed to win-lose or lose-lose situations. Keeping one's vitality and power in motion and not getting stuck. There's a lot of energy with Taurus and Scorpio, so it needs movement even though it's fixed and tends to want to get into form. Um, and with that, I think too, it's like building something that lasts and using one's focus intentionally and with value to cultivate something. Um, that's one of the esoteric or kind of occult powers of Scorpio is the nature of focus and how focus magnifies things so that when we fixate, on negative things or toxic things, we just swirl around in it even more. Like we have to get to that point of insight of, okay, this is toxic. What can I, what do I actually want? And use our focus to merge with that desired thing. Um, so powerful energies, how to keep them flowing basically. Learning how to invest and how to allocate focus and processing and breaking up deep seated ruts. Um, this nodal axis can create um, so much self-awareness and so much depth, psychological self-awareness and awareness of one's power. And that means that sometimes we like look at what's happening underneath the surface or we, um, we use that information to build something that we truly value. So I see like when people have these nodes, um, there's a sense of like intaking and receiving quite a bit they're both yin signs um, and really learning how to process um, and how to break up and transform stagnant energy. Um, so pretty profound axis. Um, you can find my weekly forecasts at monarchastrology.com and I also started uh, doing them on YouTube and I'm just here as Sabrina Monarch and I also have a podcast, Magic of the Spheres. And we have an episode Midway through, you can find it. It's called the Taurus Scorpio Mysteries, and it's a two-part episode interview exploring this axis even further because it is incredibly fascinating as an axis. So that's all I have, um, and I'm happy to take some questions. Sabrina, there are two questions in the chat. Okay. This one says, wondering if this can apply to anyone with a strong Taurus Scorpio axis, regardless of the nodes. A Taurus Sun fifth with a loaded Taurus fourth plus Pluto Uranus in the eighth and Saturn opposing those in the second, for instance. Nodes are Capricorn South and Cancer North. This rings very true. Yeah, what I just spoke about is the Taurus Scorpio axis and um, basically showing the patterns of what it's like to be stacked in one, stacked in the other, or to have both coming into this life. So that could obviously to work for, or not obviously, sorry, but it can work for um, oppositions in the natal chart or having a strong Taurus Scorpio or second and eighth house energy. So good question. And then question from Linda. There's a very intense push pull between Taurus and Scorpio. What would the health implications of this be, the effect on the mind and body? Um, yeah, I'm talking about an, a really extreme state. Like the, the stress you were talking about and the anxiety and the intensity. Yeah, I think that people like who have these nodes or this pattern in their chart and they want to work with it intentionally. It's a lot of learning how to feel balanced in the nervous system, like how to access safety inside. Um, obviously like getting to a place in the world that feels safe, you know, it's a basic need to be safe and to have shelter, but let's say we already have that and we're basically safe, but we're always running a sense of fear and not feeling safe. Then it's learning maybe some, breathing techniques or stress reduction techniques or um, 
eating the kinds of foods that we need, like just having a very, um, like learning how to cultivate peace in the body and the yoga, like it could, whatever access point that someone gets into that. And then I think it's also like a, a positive relationship with pleasure and f- like feeling safe to feel good. Um, Cause if we have a nervous system patterning that, you know, things are always hitting the fan and we can never relax, then we feel vigilant and we don't know how to relax when things feel okay. So I think it's like learning and truly it's interesting too, like this is a self practice to get into those feeling states, but we often actually need teachers and guides, which is more of a Scorpio expanding past our limitations kind of thing. Um, Like I have a lot of mentors and guides, um, but one who's on the internet that I just like love her content is Layla Martin. And she teaches a lot about um, Tantra, but she also teaches about breath work and I just think it's really incredible that there are teachers out there who are giving people tools of how to feel safer and how to feel more connected to their own bodies. And it's so interesting that it's like very much that person's own body, right? But it's an external influence who's helping them um, build those techniques for themselves. So that's a little bit of a ramble, but I think that it, it has something to do with learning new skill sets of how to be embodied and being open to guides and helpers along that. And I think that it's a very sensitive, within Taurus Scorpio, like we're sensitive about where we get help from and if we trust the source of help, um, but that can lead to just staying in a rut and not getting help at all. So I think making steps towards embodiment um, would be a huge thing for the Taurus Scorpio axis. Um, there's a question from Tova. What are the what are some tips when the resolution node is the south node? Um, generally, I think in that case that the north node is still acting as a north node for like the majority of the individual's like life, but it's the planet that's squaring the nodes that has unfinished stuff with the south node. So it almost becomes more local to the planet. Um, But I think that it also, with the nodal axis, it's about balancing the nodes and having a positive or a healthy or a pleasurable or whatever the word we want to use relationship to both of the archetypes. And that that can diffuse the intensity of vacillating between them in unhealthy ways. Okay, Sabrina, uh, any questions from our Zoom audience? No, I just, I resonate with everything that, and the other questions have helped me. I have a Saturn in the second and the moon in the eighth. Thank you. Yes, this was an excellent meeting and I'm looking forward to the others in this series. So Sabrina, thank you so much from all of us. Would you all please thank Sabrina Monarch. Thank you, Sabrina. That was really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sabrina.